Hello, everybody, and here we are again, and welcome to our self-publishing poetry podcast this week with Dalma. Hi, Dalma. Hi, Orna, and hi, everyone. It's great to be here back for the Alliance of Independent Authors um, self-publishing podcast. And once a month, we focus on self-publishing poetry. And there is a little um, well-known festival coming up called uh, <laughs> Valentine's Day. And probably more poetry exchanged, read, um, written and uh, thought about at that time of the year than any other and so we decided that we would focus our um, show today on the challenges and the delights of self-publishing love poetry in particular so yeah Dalma you're a fan of love poetry sure I mean I think everyone who gets into poetry probably does when they are uh, a teenager and when you're a teenager your hormones come in and with hormones oh, yeah. come, uh, come I think angst and love and yeah basically th that's when I got into poetry so I, I'm, I'm definitely a fan and uh, how how are your thoughts about that so what's <laughs> I'm fascinated by, I mean, absolutely, I started writing poetry as so many of us did um, in exactly that, you know, mooning over some long forgotten boy who I thought was the absolute centre of the universe at the time. Uh, sure. <laughs> and yes, he didn't agree with, uh, you know, he didn't think I was the centre of his universe. And so po oh, poetry was the only thing that could help me to cope with this terrible trauma. Um, but it, it does fascinate me even now, kind of many, many moons later, mm. how love poetry is so popular always. It never mm. goes out of fashion. It's something mm. that people always are interested in. It's the form of poetry that is by far the most popular today on social media as, mm -hmm. you know, back in the sort of court court of King Henry VIII and back yeah. into the, the medieval and back I suppose in the bardic times uh, a lot of what has survived to now is political poetry but also mm -hmm. some incredibly beautiful love poetry so sure. um, yeah the first thing I'd like to say if you're looking for really good poems to read um, there's a great link to some really beautiful some stunningly beautiful mm -hmm. um, Love Poems on Book Riot, which is a great mm -hmm. curation site for all kinds of books. And um, so you get that at bookriot.com um, forward slash 2018 or 119 forward slash love hyphen poems. Don't worry about the link. It will be in the show notes. <laughs> you can see it later because you're not going to remember all that, are you? <laughs> but yeah, it's a great place to start if you haven't, enjoy, you know, if you're not uh, kind of familiar with the pleasure of love poetry mm -hmm. or a great place to perhaps read some old favorites. Discover new ones. And discover yeah. new ones. Exactly mm -hmm. right. So Do you we have a favorite one, though? I just wanted to ask, do you have some that you always come back to to revisit? I, you mean love poetry generally mm -hmm. or on this yeah. link yes i have um for me it's yates the great oh, yeah. love yeah. the great love affair and the great yeah. love poet and he of course was struck by this huge passion for um his muse maud gone mm -hmm. at the age of 23 yeah. and that was a love affair that took him through his entire life and he wrote about it he was still writing about it in his 50s and 60s and the mm. different ways in which the love had changed and he captured love so beautifully and um in beautiful nature um images um and that still today i've read them a hundred thousand million times mm. and they are as fresh for me today as they were the first time i read them back when i was a moony teenager trying to <laughs> <laughs> write my own and in no way writing proper poetry just, you know sure. kind of lashing out words um, <laughs> which is different to crafting poems as we're going to talk about mm. a little in a, in a few moments but yeah we've been looking at the trends um, mm -hmm. in poetry at the moment and um, you know I know you're really keen on, on examining trends and you're very you very much have your finger on the pulse of the poetry trends mm -hmm. So specifically, when it comes to love poetry, what um, 
what's going on? What do people who might be interested in self-publishing poetry books mm -hmm. need to know about what's popular among readers at the mm -hmm. moment? Um, I think generally you would say about self-publishing poetry that empowerment and inspiration are generally in the heart of it. And this translates to love poems as well. So empowerment in a sense that, you know, traditionally um, romantic poems are about um, female and male love and traditional uh, gender roles in a sense that the woman is an attainable object of affection and, uh, and generally male po poets are talking about how a woman is perceived. And uh, of course it changed during the 20th century, but now it's much more about how, um, how supportive can be a relationship and from both ends. So um, female poets are talking about how uh, they want to be desired. So, and about female desires. So definitely it's a confessional uh, poetry uh, nowadays. So uh, especially, I think I talked about Rupi Kaur before. She was one of the big influencers who started the self-publishing trends on uh, Instagram. And uh, she was the first one to talk about how she had traumatic relationships, but how she arrived after a while to through self-love and through accepting who she is to a supportive relationship and talks about how a healing relationship can be loving and, and generally about this. Um, otherwise, what's also interesting is uh, while nature poetry is definitely still there, uh, as in almost all uh, love poems, uh, but everyday object and everyday situations, you know, washing the dishes together uh, can be just as poetic as strolling in nature. Um, so yeah, that's definitely there. Um, otherwise, uh, one of them that I particularly like and one of my personal favorites is um, retelling um, great love stories. So, you know, fairy tales, Cinderella or Little Mermaid or, um, or um, classic myths. Um, and um, a, lot of, a lot of female poets do this nowadays. I very encourage a lot of people to check out Amanda Lovelace's uh, The Princess Saves Herself in this one. That's one of the, the books or volumes that are a must, I think, to, to figure out where poetry is right now. And the other is uh, Nikita Jill's um, Great Goddesses. And uh, one of my favorite ones there is Persephone's um, confession about how she is the queen of the underworld and uh, how she feels about Hades. And it's, it's, it's a very different take on the classical myths. So yeah, I, I think that this is generally how, to, how it, it, it shifted. Um, and this goes for, for male, male poets as well. So uh, there is one, one um, I th part of poem that I wrote for this particularly. Um, and yes, uh, because we want to include in this um, particular podcast because poetry is so short and we can we want to include <laughs> what, um, poetry as possible so no, we're not just talking about how to publish poems but we're also yeah. giving some examples of people who are doing it really well so yeah, yeah. you're going to you're going to read a short poem for us I think very very short uh, so it's basically just a part of a poem but it definitely illustrates what I was talking about, about shifting how to perceive uh, women or perceive love. So this is from Analogue de Leon, who is actually Chris Purifoy. Um, she will go to bed at night, certain of her beauty. She will wake up in the morning, convince her of her value. So, um, you know, basically just empowering women through love. So. This, this is a very different take on what it was before. Um, it, so, it, yeah. yeah. 
It's fantastic. And and what, what we're seeing here, I think, um, as a as a large and overall trend and one that indies can fit right into and are helping to further and um you know take take yeah. out there is uh, new voices and mm -hmm. um, new voices doesn't just mean that somebody else gets to speak but when the new voices are a whole category of people like uh, the women who were always the muse who are now becoming much more active I mean women yeah. always wrote poetry and they always wrote poetry in which they rejected being constantly the passive sort of object yeah. of a male affections and you know right we've got right back to Sappho mm. to, to know that that is true but so little of it survived and got uh, taken into the canon yeah. that when I was growing up uh, poets were male it was almost mm. that simple and it wasn't until I read Virginia Woolf and her yeah. idea that anonymous was a woman mm -hmm. that I realized how much you know women had been written out and mm -hmm. I think what we're seeing very vividly today is the change in that that mm -hmm. women are and because publication is now so widespread and because women can read women in a completely different way without a mediating kind of publisher in between mm -hmm. it's really opening the scene up for um new voices to be saying voices. new things and i think the what you just read there is is a splendid sort of example of that mm -hmm. And expanding out from that, we've got this really vibrant, and we, we could pick lots of different areas where we would see the same thing, mm. uh, you know, that's happening with women, happening with other groups and um, other minorities and other people who have traditionally been marginalized. And of course, mm. when it comes to love and um, it the LGBT. Uh, QAI plus group is um, incredibly active in yeah. this arena of writing about poetry and sexuality and, mm. um, you know, producing amazing er uh, erotic poems. And we're getting to hear about ways of thinking about love that, mm. you know, we didn't before. Yeah. And um, I really would, um, you know, recommend people to think about reading outside your normal kind of comfort zone. Mm -hmm. so, so often, I think the reason that people are put off poetry is they only know old poets who seem to be writing sure. about stuff that seems to have no kind of relevance to them. Mm -hmm. And yeah. one, of, one of the great ways is to step outside yourself and to sure. look at different things. So drag poetica. Um, is you know drag poetry is kind of remaking um, all our ideas about otherness and artifice and contradictions that are inherent in what it is to love somebody, what it is to love ourselves. One of my favorite poems on the scene there, and I could have picked a hundred, but I, I was mm -hmm. only able to pick this one. And um, again, keeping it very short, Wo Chan. Um, fantastic fashion um, person, uh, drag artist, and mm. a brilliant poet also. Mm. And the poem goes like this. I was the smell of ripe lemons in his oxbone nation. I was never brave, but he let me eat butter, held me like an egg. Mm. And these short, sort of snippets mm. of I mean, that contain for me that contains so much and tells you so mm. much about what that relationship the tenderness at the heart mm -hmm. of that relationship and um, these short pieces that are kind of turning up on Instagram all over the place can seem very simple but mm. they can be deeply profound and sometimes the simplicity is on the surface and uh, after a, a reading or two it kind of sinks in just mm -hmm how much is being said. <clears throat> so in the show notes for the show, we have um, sort of lots of journals and publishers that are publishing love poetry. And it's one of the few areas in poetry where you can actually get paid um, when you submit to journals and <laughs> magazines and stuff. So um, we, you know, normally with this show is all about self-publishing books and kind of choosing yourself and putting your own stuff out there and doing that on social media and all of that. But 
it is also useful and we will look in a later show about how to use publication in literary journals to build your reputation and discoverability of your books mm. and so on and it's certainly uh, more worthwhile doing that in love poetry than in any other genre so if you're interested in doing that um there are lots of journals um uh, Q, Q Moonicate and begins with a Q instead of a C, the Gay and Lesbian Review, Screen Door Review, Headmistress Press, Gertrude Press um, are all fabulous journals um, in this arena mm -hmm. and there are some very good awards too and again we'll do a show specifically on awards in a while but uh, the Lambada Awards, sorry Lambda, L-A-M-B-D yeah awards are really worth checking out as well so um, as I said you don't need to scribble all these down we'll have them in the show notes um, in the uh, with the transcript but uh, yeah so um, should we talk about the different types of poetry and and what happens in, mm -hmm. in those different kinds of poems um, you mentioned confessional mm -hmm. so just to give people maybe an idea of what that means? Confessional, um, originally it, it, it started in the 60s with probably, you know, um, Sylvia Plath. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's pro most of the time to told from a first personal view. Um, and uh, it's, it's very deep, it's very psychological. Uh, it evokes images that are very emotional, um, not necessarily uh, nature, not, nat not necessarily observant, but mostly about feelings. Uh, and th this is what I would say. And most of the time right now, nowadays on, on Instagram, that's, um, that's something that you would definitely uh, come in contact with when when you when you you look at it um, yeah um, in, a, in a short do you, um, have anything to add uh, to this yeah I think the um, the thing about confessional is it's very hard it's hard to do it well so we see a lot of it but a lot of it <laughs> could be pros you know sure. it's not it's sure. not and um, now the best of it is absolutely brilliant uh, but because you're writing from the heart and very often I mean confessional yeah. Poetry, you can assume it's the poet's um, feelings that are being discovered, but mm -hmm. they're not writing uh, through another voice, which in other yeah, yeah. types of poetry, I think you can't assume, but here, mm -hmm. here you can. And the thing about it is that it is, um, you need to have strong and vivid imagery. It's very mm -hmm. easy for the poetry to be a little kind of, um, to sound come off as kind of just whinging, moaning, complaining, <laughs> feeling sorry for yourself. Uh, you need something in the actual yeah. work that very true makes it fresh. Um, so it's deeply intimate. I think if it uh -huh. isn't, if it isn't kind of scary, if you're not revealing mm. and opening up something that's kind of typically kept private in in normal yeah. whatever that is life. And um, then it's not really confessional. And I think yeah. readers really want this stuff. You know, they sure. want, they're really, and editors too are very interested in, in very intimate explorations mm. of your most private thoughts and yeah. your most emotional thoughts. Yeah. Um, and of course that brings us to erotica, which is <laughs> like also um, blooming. And I think, you know, there's always this fine line with, love poetry at mm -hmm. what point if you're describing passion physical passion mm -hmm. at what point is it love poetry and at what point does it kind of tip into erotica and yeah i think the definition is that erotica is actually trying to stir a sexual response or mm -hmm. even you know full-on sexual gratification in the reader yeah. So it's not just describing yeah. something that happened um and and you know bringing in bodily mm -hmm. imagery but it's going, it's going a bit further than that. Yeah. yeah. So some tips um, on writing love poetry, I think, is to avoid <laughs> the sentimental. 
Mm -hmm. So cliches and banalities, you know, over time, something that was really a lot of what our cliches now were beautifully fresh images when they were first written and they were so true that they got passed on, but now they're stale. <laughs> and so if yeah. you're using them, you're um you know, you're you're not actually doing your your subject any favors mm -hmm. and you're not sure. going to get that spark of recognition in the reader definitely, definitely. but it's so, it's very hard i think to you you can maybe reverse expectations so that's one of the things that you can do with sentimental images that can you can kind of use them ironically but it's incredibly hard so altogether just you can find something new or discover something new a way to express some uh, feelings or emotions yes I, I think it is definitely about newness. And I think the way into that is to be completely unique and individual. Mm -hmm. So to go very deeply into mm -hmm. your own personal experience using the lens of the five senses. So being, you know, rooting it in concrete truth, your own truth through imagery of mm -hmm. sounds and smells and tastes and uh, as well as sights and and yes. you know we, we very often jump to a visual age but in love poetry particular because we're looking for that sensuality bringing mm. in the other senses is is very often the way in and to remember that cliche is not just cliched phrases or words it's also cliched images things that we're just you know my love is like a red, red rose. No, don't. Um, not unless you really just want to kind of hit it over the head. You know, don't use that red rose. Now, the red rose has been used again when it was first written. That that poem is still a favourite poem among um, sure. many people and was, was hugely fresh in the dialect it was written in and everything else at the time. And the rose as an image of love has been used across the centuries in yeah. you know, lots of fresh and different ways. So if you are going to write about that red rose, then <laughs> know what you're doing, yeah. know its tradition. <laughs> Um, and what you're invoking there, yeah, sure. And what sure. you're invoking. And I think this comes back to reading. I think there are mm -hmm. too many, too many poets writing who don't read, yeah. um, who don't know the tradition. They don't know where they sit. They don't know what's done before. And I've had poets say to me, I don't want to ruin my, you know, my own kind That's, of feeling and emotion. <laughs> by you're not going to. <laughs> you're you're not that. going to. Yeah. <laughs> You're definitely not, not going to. I think, uh, if anything, that's going to inspire you uh, in what, what those kind of uh, poems and words and, and verses or rhythms uh, invoke uh, in you, that's going to inspire you as a poet, most, most probably. Absolutely. And learning from technique. The only way you can kind of know how work, because the other thing that makes a poem good is word skill you know, being skilled with words, understanding the different nuances of rhythm and rhyme um, and how it works and how it doesn't work and and all of that. And you absorb a lot of that subconsciously just by doing a lot of reading. So do read a lot in the um, genre in which you like to write and, and not just on Insta you know, get, yeah. least, <laughs> get out there and find, um, you know, there are great poets who aren't on social media, but also that whole idea of a tradition, because every single type of poem that is being written now has been written before. And love is the perennial emotion that doesn't change in, in yeah. some ways. It just gets new expressions. <laughs> so um, in terms of, of kind of understanding what's gone before it's really important to, to know where you fit in what kind of po poet you are are you remaking things are you rewriting from a new vision are you you know who has said what before and how have they said it yeah um and i did mention rhyme there in passing rhyme is very out of fashion i think it would be fair to say at the moment um, I know you have some thoughts. Um, are you a fan of, of rhyming poetry or do you just prefer if it doesn't rhyme? <laughs> uh, I'm a fan of 
um, rhyming poetry when it was done well um, a couple of hundred years ago. Uh, <laughs> but I think it had its moment and now it's incredibly hard. As you said before, rhymes um, are not, I would say, infinite. So there are rhyming cliches as well. So um, it's not, not in fashion at the moment and you can do um, slant rhyme, uh, but you know, it's now, nowadays I would say uh, prose or free form, um, free writing, uh, rhythm is definitely something that you have to have, but it can be thought rhythm. It can be um, it, it can be completely different. You do not need to fall back on rhyme. It can be forced. It can be very obvious. Um, and uh, nowadays there are different type of expressions that you can use uh, to to illustrate emotion or keep rhythm. Yeah, rhythm, of course, uh, as rhyme has gone down in fashion, rhythm has come up and uh, we've got all the, um, particularly the rap artists and a yeah. lot of the performing artists who also take in love. It's not just anger and politics in that scene. <laughs> and there's some amazing um, poetry, uh, you know, which uh, rhythm, obviously, yeah. uh, love and sex are rhythmical acts. <laughs> and, and that can be played out really interestingly it's, in, yeah. in, in poetry and and I've heard uh, some people doing that in a, in a really sort of interesting way. I have to confess to have just gotten it. I do write some rhyming poetry. I have written rhyme before and I wrote my first sonnet last month, which of course demands mm -hmm demands rhyme, sure. not, to do, not only rhyme, but rhyme in A, B, C, D, E, yeah. F, you know, <laughs> they got a really strict kind of layout and form. Sure. I can't read these poems because they're still private uh, to my patrons. Mm -hmm. I can get my poetry exclusively for the first um, three months, so they won't be released more broadly until then. I will say that I'm only getting into rhyme now after mm -hmm nearly 20 years of writing home so yeah. and and for me at the moment it's a it's a challenge to see can sure. i um you know do it beyond, well. yeah mm -hmm. do it well get beyond the cliche mm -hmm. you know and and do something um yeah a little bit different with the sonnet which is a very old and kind of ancient form absolutely so, yeah absolutely yeah just one one thing to add here um i uh i did my my thesis in in um a form of poetry called villanelle which is very oh, yeah. strict about rhyme and rhythm and uh, i it's did it worse uh, than the sonnet it's even more yeah, strict. yeah exactly <laughs> it is it's very playful but uh it's incredibly hard to do it well and i did it um in the the poetry of Sylvia Plath and uh, how it became kind of defining for her after a while as well, and uh, and ever since I encountered some some people who try to do it well, and sometimes it's it's brilliant uh, if you find it uh, what what the rhythm and what the whole form is about. It can be incredibly brilliant. Brilliant. So I think I encourage people to challenge themselves to do that. Um, but yeah, it's it's hard. It's difficult for sure. Yeah, it is. It is more challenging. And again, it's something if you haven't read a lot of them, don't don't try and write one. Because <laughs> 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 you're not going to be able to. It's that simple. Sure. Um, yeah, so just a few kind of final tips on the whole mm -hmm. um, poetry book publication. Yeah. Um, as, as poetry is one of the few areas, as love poetry is one of the few areas where you can actually get paid, don't put your poems out on social media or the internet if you are then going to submit them to a literary journal because a lot of the journals and magazines Mm -hmm. will have a kind of a rule against that so you will be ruling out the poem so just kind of keep that in mind if it's something you want to do in terms of publishing poetry as well love poetry in particular get outside the book's world love mm -hmm. poems are beautiful gifts and you know as, around valentine's day especially you know people are looking for gifts to give their loved ones yeah. 
you could maybe work with an artist, work with a musician mm. uh, to create something lovely. But think also about gift shops, card shops, you know, mm. that kind of thing. These could be good outlets for your love poetry over and beyond the kind of the straight publishing to Amazon and the other retail yeah. stores and publishing on your own website. Women's glossy magazines have money. They have lots of, um, <laughs> you know, from po uh, perfume and beauty products and all yeah. that. So, uh, they have money and they pay for poetry. So um, you can actually, some take them, some don't, and you need to, you need to know that they do. So um, it's definitely worth checking out because you'll be paid a lot more by um, a glossy magazine than you'll ever be paid by a literary journal yeah. um, um, and then you know there are people who are compiling who specifically are looking for good love poetry to put into anthologies and that's an opportunity um, like contests and anth anthologies mm -hmm. and poetry contests are both opportunities to kind of take take your poems out there and and build up a following and as I said we'll be talking about ways of doing that, uh, not just in relation to love poetry, but in relation to all kinds of poetry on another show. So I think that is it for today, unless you had anything you wanted to add to our love poetry publishing. Nope. Okay, I have a poem I'm gonna read and Ooh. finish it off. <laughs> this is about love, of course. This is from um, one of my chapbook series, which I encourage you all to do. I, when I, what I do with my poems, and this is a really good way, again, of kind of getting your work out there without producing a big book. And I did this at the very beginning of my self-publishing career. Mm -hmm. The first book I published was in this series. It was just this size. It's just 10 poems. So when I when they're publishable, I kind of store them. And when I have 10 of them, I turn them into a chapbook like this. And um, yeah, so this is a poem called Love Hurts. No way. <laughs> Love hurts, they say. I say, no way. Ah, there's a rhyme, Dama. <laughs> <laughs> Love hurts, they say. I say, no way. The only thing that never hurts is love. Lust festers, envy bites. Loss skewers, rejection spikes. Passion burns, craving seethes. Romance dazzles, lonesome bleeds. Well, yes, indeed. But none of the above is love. Love helps. Love lights. Love warms. Love writes. Love soothes. Love feeds. Love calms. Love heals. Yes, what will heal the sting of pain and make your life feel good again, 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 and yet again is love. Love hurts, they say. I say, no way. The only thing that never hurts is love. So that is it on Love Poetry, I think, for this time. We would love to have your submissions for poems next time. Um, how to do that is on ornaross.com forward slash indie hyphen poetry hyphen please. Again, it will be in the show notes. Um, and we want to include more poetry in this session. So please do um, send us in your poems. We, we, we're really keen to hear them and to read them. So anything to finish? Mm, I just wanted to say that as you, um, as you said before, um, your poem is very much an ex uh, expression of, you know, supporting love. So not necessarily, not love hurts, as you said, but love heals and love warms. So yeah, yeah, it's a lovely, lovely thing to think about for Valentine's Day, I think. Oh, thank you. And right on trend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you everybody for joining us. We look forward to receiving your poetry and we'll be here next month. And next month we're going to be talking about the very thorny subject of poetry editing, finding an editor, working with an editor, when to bring an editor in, when not. Poetry is one of the very few areas 
where sometimes um, the poems are not actually edited by anybody else. So we'll be talking about what we think about that and inviting your experiences and what you think about that and hopefully reading you some more great poetry. So thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you. Bye. Bye. bye.